Sorry, wrong one. Right. So the events uh, of the coming of Jesus, uh, the coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. So this is this involves what I'm what I'll be telling you tonight involves both his first coming, the purpose of his first coming, and his um and then the events leading up to his second coming. So there are uh, altogether five main events, five main events, and I call them Talanoa, of course, because it's easier for us Tongans to understand Talanoa as a story. Um, but when I talk about story, I mean they are historical stories. They are stories of events that happen. Okay, So Talanoa, number one, the event number one is that in the Old Testament, if we, if we start, we, we must start with Malachi chapter four. Malachi chapter four, verses five and six, you look at the whole chapter, it's really about judgment. Um, verse 1 of Malachi chapter 4 is looking forward to the day when the Lord comes. And this is the expectation for, for Jesus' is coming. Look, the day is coming burning like a furnace when all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will become stubble. The coming day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them rude or prances, but for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go about and playfully jump from calves um, from the store, like calves from the store. And then it goes on. You see, that's the expectation of the coming of Jesus. And how do we know the coming of Jesus? That then uh, Malachi says. That look, verse 5, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. So before the coming of the Lord, the prophet Elijah will appear. And once Elijah comes, the next event the immediate next event would be the coming of the day of the Lord, the day of burning, you know, the, the furnace that Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 had been describing. And so when we come to the New Testament, the birth of John the Baptist is predicted in terms of the coming of Elijah. So Luke chapter 1, verses 16 to 17, this is the angel talking to Zechariah in the temple, and he's talking about John, John the Baptist. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. See? So the prediction of the coming of John is in, in line with the expectation of Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 that you know, he will come with the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. So John the Baptist is going to come and prepare a people for the Lord because the Lord is coming, bringing the day of wrath. Now, Jesus, when he spoke about John the Baptist, he identified John as the Elijah to come. Uh, you may remember this is Matthew 11, and, and John, we'll look at this a little bit later, John had sent some people, some of his disciples, to ask whether Jesus is the one to come. Remember that John must have been living with the expectation of Malachi, that Jesus was meant to bring in the day of wrath to destroy the enemies of the people of God and to establish God's people as his people and the kingdom of God from in, in Jerusalem. And he's sitting in the prison, in, in um, King Herod's prison, and he's wondering. So he sent some people to question Jesus. And when they returned, Jesus said to his disciple, if you are willing to accept it, John the Baptist 
is the Elijah who is to come. Let anyone who has ears listen. So what is meant by let anyone who has ears listen is that if you if you had listened to the word of God in the Old Testament, where Elijah is predicted to come before the day of the Lord, you could see that where they were right now with Jesus in their midst is supposed to be the fulfillment of the day of the Lord that the Old Testament prophets were expecting. Now, so John came and he was also preparing the, the way of the Lord. Remember what he says in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, in those days John the Baptist came uh, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And, and so, um, for he is the one uh, spoken of through the prophet Isaiah who said, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So you see that um, John came to prepare the way of the Lord, expecting, of course, that the Lord will bring judgment. So he was still expecting judgment because if you remember when he was baptizing and the Sadducees and the Pharisees were coming over to him to be baptized, and Jesus warned them right, in, in, uh, in uh, Matthew Chapter 3, verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of wives, of vipers, who want you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. So you see that even John, he was still expecting that Jesus will be bringing God's wrath, the day of destruction upon the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people. And so that is why he was quite disappointed, as I said before, and he was sitting there in, the, in prison, in the prison of uh, Herod Antipas in Galilee, awaiting his beheaded, and he's wondering, what, what's Jesus doing? Was he the one? Because he was still hoping that Jesus, if Jesus was to come and bring wrath, the wrath of God, why is he still sitting in prison? I mean, he's not an enemy of God. Herod should have been the one to be destroyed. Okay? So that is why he sent a delegate to Jesus uh, asking him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? But you see, in Jesus' reply to John, Jesus was indicating to John, John, this is not yet the day of wrath. I'm bringing a day of salvation before the day of wrath. So that's the bit that John the Baptist himself did not really understand about the coming of the Lord fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. So Jesus said to the delegates from John the Baptist, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind received your sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who is an offender of me. So you see, Jesus is saying, this is the day of salvation. I'm bringing, you know, sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, and walking to the lame. The day of the Lord will come, but it will be another day. It will be later. It will be the second coming. Now, we wonder then, so what, what did Jesus then come to bring? Now, I want to I wanna say, and I think I, uh, I, I'll give you the background of this, that Jesus came to fulfill the promise that God gave to David. You may remember, I think, um, several times in our past unit, I showed you, and even uh, during this unit, I showed you the two big promises of the kingdom um, in the Old Testament that fulfilled in Jesus. First is the promise to Abraham, in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, where God promised Abraham a land, a great nation, and blessing. And I said that the great nation is the kingdom of God, and the land will be the land in which the great nation will live, and the blessing will be the blessing of the people who will be part of that great nation, the offspring of Abraham. The second great promise of the Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus 
you know, the, the promise of the kingdom uh, in, uh, of the Old Testament fulfilled in Jesus is the promise to David. And that's the one I think is very central to the ministry, understanding the ministry of Jesus um, in, in the four Gospels. And it comes from um, 2 Samuel. So this is 2 Samuel. Um, and um, 2 Samuel chapter 7. And I'm reading from the end of uh, verse 11 to verse 16. Listen to this. This is the promise, I believe, that Jesus is fulfilling in his earthly ministry. And God is sending this word to David through the prophet Nathan. Nathan. And he said, the Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will make you, will make a house for you. Remember, David had wanted to build a house for the Lord. Eventually, it was built by Solomon. But the Lord was promising not that house, not the house built by Solomon, but a house that will build by an offspring of David. And this is what the Lord is talking about. The Lord himself will make a house for you. When your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up after you, your descendant, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will, be, I will discipline him with a rod of men and blows from, from mortals. But my faithful love will never leave him as he did when I removed it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. So you see that the promise to David includes a kingdom and a house, a kingdom and a house. And I do believe that that's what Jesus um, brought to uh, the midst of his people of Israel um, in his earthly ministry. Jesus brings the kingdom of David to the midst of his people. So, you see, um, and he, not only the kingdom, but he also built the house. Remember the promise to David, your kingdom will be established forever, and I will build you a house. So kingdom and house are both brought by Jesus and established in our midst. So, do you remember in the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 16, we're told after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, in Mark's gospel, Jesus is the good news. So to say repent and believe the good news is the same as saying re repent and believe in me because Jesus is bringing the kingdom of God near. You may remember from our studies in the, I think it was lecture two, I told you that the kingdom of God promised to David here in 2 Samuel 7 was seen to be partially fulfilled in the kingdom of King Solomon where they saw you know, King Solomon sat on the throne of God. He was the son of God because that's what the Lord said to him. You'll be my son. And um, he, he himself amassed to himself uh, you know, a lot of uh, treasure. Uh, the nations were paying tribute to him. The Queen of Sheba brought the, uh, the Gentiles you know, trying to find out about his wisdom. And, you know, King Solomon prospered because he was seen to be the fulfillment of, you know, the kingdom of God. He was a kingdom, and of course, he was the builder of God's house. So the same thing should be seen in the coming of Jesus. He brings the kingdom because he is the king of the kingdom, the rightful king of the kingdom, but also he will build the house of God in the midst of mankind. So. And then, you know, remember in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, he's driving out demons and the leaders, 
the religious leaders are arguing with him and saying to him, look, you know, you, you're doing these things, but, you know, you, you're doing it in the power of, uh, uh, in, in the power of, of the uh, you know, the, the uh, prince of the demons. And then Jesus, you know, said to them, if I drive out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. See, so in other words, he, he indicated to them that what he's, what he's doing, what he's showing them in exorcising demons is that this is the power of the kingdom of God. So Jesus has brought in the kingdom of God into our midst. And everything that Jesus is doing is showing us this is the power of this kingdom. If you come, if you enter this kingdom, this is what will happen to you. You'll be set free from demonic oppression, demonic enslavement. Your sins will be forgiven. You will be healed because there is a, resurrect, a, resurrect, a resurrected body. Um, you will be content with what you have because, you know, I feed uh, the birds of the air. I will feed to you too, and I'll pro I will provide for you too. See? He is bringing the kingdom of God into our midst. And he showed the power of the kingdom of God by all the miracles that he performs. Now, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32 to 34, Jesus makes it more uh, clearer. He said to his disciples, don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give to the poor, make money bags for yourselves, and don't grow old. Uh, and uh, sorry, for yourselves that won't grow old. An inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys you. The effect of what he's saying, God has given you the kingdom, little flock. He's delighted to give you the kingdom. You see, it's a gift. He's given it to us as a gift. So go sell all your possessions and give to the poor. And in, in other words, he's saying, make that kingdom your treasure. Because if you, if you seek um, other things besides the kingdom, you will lose the kingdom. You, you, you have a choice of either living for this kingdom, seeking first this kingdom of God, and all its righteousness will be added unto you, or... You, you will go and you will try to serve two masters to serve the kingdom and serve the dresses of this world. And you will eventually lose the kingdom. The kingdom must become your treasure. But you see, the point is Jesus brought the kingdom and he's giving it to us as a gift. And because it's a gift, we should make it our treasure. We should sell all our possessions. Remember what Jesus said to that rich young man who came to him? Go sell all your possessions and keep to the poor and come follow me. One of the um, great theologians uh, of the 19th century who died and uh, um, Adolf Hitler in Germany is a guy called the Dietrich von Hofer and he said, you know, the only true disciples of Jesus are the people who sell everything and follow Jesus. People who make him their treasure. They're the only true disciples of Jesus. They love Jesus more and they love anything else in this world. Now, but that's the kingdom. But do you remember the, the promise to David is that there will be a kingdom and a house, right? The kingdom of God will be established forever, and God will build him a house. So what about the house God promised to David? Jesus also promised to build that house. Remember, this is why he cleansed the temple. Now, when you read the four Gospels, there are two accounts of the cleansing of the temple. In John chapter 2, uh, John, John gives us the first account. And I do believe that Jesus did it twice in order to show uh, the people the importance of this. And the, the other account is at the end of his life. And that's what all the other, the th other three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are talking about. He did it again at the end when he went back to Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem the last week uh, of his um, ministry. He cleansed the temple once again just to show them how serious this matter is, that this temple is obsolete, right? This temple is finished. 
Um, you know, its aim was to point to me. I'm the owner of this house. You, you think about what Jesus did in the cleansing the house. I mean, if I were to walk into your house and I start saying to you, look, put the chair over there, took this, this, take this out, turn the sofa over to that side. You may think I'm a lunatic, isn't it? Because I don't own your house. But what if I'm the landlord and I'm walking into your house and I'm trying to reorganize it? Well, exactly the same thing, exactly the same way in which Jesus came to the temple, right? He is the owner of the house. His father, the house belongs to his father. And that's why he said to them, look, take all these things out. Stop making the house a den of thieves. It was meant to be a house of prayers for the nations. See, he was cleansing the house because he's preparing this house for the next house, the resurrected house, the restored temple of God, which is the real temple that the prophecies of the Old Testament were looking forward to. Well, I keep on saying to you, my friends, that a lot of Christians are looking to Israel, especially to, to, to Jerusalem, with the hope that a third temple will be built in it. But there will be no third temple built in Jerusalem. Even if they build a third temple, we won't need that. See, what would you do in a third temple? Would you again go and sacrifice animals to God? I mean, what would, what would happen? What would you be showing God if you say you need the animal sacrifices again? Doesn't it mean that the sacrifice of Jesus is not enough. You see, the sacrifice of Jesus is the one sacrifice that we need for the forgiveness of sins. And so therefore, that's why I'm saying the third temple is built by Jesus when he said to them there, you know, remember after the after he cleansed the temple in John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, they said to him, why are you doing this? And, um, and then Jesus said to them, look, I'm going to destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And they were saying, well, this temple took 46 years to build. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. So his resurrection is the establishment of the temple, the third temple, the temple that God had promised David, right? Promised David, his offspring will come. His kingdom of his offspring will be a kingdom that will never end, but also God will build a house for David. And so this is the house. Jesus is the house. Jesus is the temple destroyed through his death, but rebuilt restored in his, in, his, in his resurrection. What does that mean? Now, remember what Jesus said to Peter in the, um, on the way to Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16, 18, right? Uh, Peter is just saying to Jesus, well, you are the uh, son of God, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Jesus said to Peter, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, you see that Jesus is promising to build the church. Now, that's the house that he promised today. The house is now his church, and he's building it upon the rock. Of course, you know, we can we can accept the interpretation of the Roman Catholics and say it's Peter, but Peter was such a weak apostle. He was meant to be the leading apostle, but you remember he denied Jesus three times. And I do believe that if it's Peter, Jesus is meaning that he will use weak people like Peter to build this church so that at the end, the glory belongs to Jesus, not to us, not to Peter. But, you know, we will see later on that Peter tells us he is not the rock. Okay? But, you see, what I wanted to see is that it's very important. These are, these are very important things that Jesus did in his ministry just to show us, you know, behind the scene 
he is bringing about the kingdom of David and the house of David that God, God has promised to David that he will establish. So, so in, in building this, this house, Jesus said he is the stone the builder needed for the house. Okay. So when he um when he was telling this parable, you know, he was rejected, he was questioning his authority, and Jesus knew exactly what they meant by questioning his authority. What authority? Who are you to do these things? You know, this is this is what they questioned him after he did the first cleansing of the temple in John's gospel. They did it again when he came back to Jerusalem three years later, cleansed the temple. They asked the same thing. Who are you? Where you come from? Who give you the authority to do these things? And then Jesus uh, told them this parable. Okay, A parable uh, is the parable of the vineyard. The person who, who built the vineyard, built it and rented it out to, and leased it out to, uh, um, to hired workers. And when he wanted the harvest, you remember the parable, he keeps sending his servants. They keep beating up his servants. And last of all, he sent his son. But they killed him because they said, well, we need the vineyard. We'll get wood. We'll take the vineyard, we'll kill the son, and we will own the vineyard. And then, you know, of course, um, the owner will come. That's what Jesus was saying. The owner will come and destroy those farmers and give the vineyard to others. And I think what Jesus meant by that, that now the vineyard is the kingdom of God is given to us, his people, believers. Now, but then as a result of uh, telling that parable, he said to them, haven't you read the scripture? And here he's quoting Psalm 118. And he says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. Do you see the stone? So Jesus is talking about himself. He's rejected by the builders. So, so Israel were meant to be the builders. And they were meant to receive the stone, Jesus, so that together they will build the third temple, the temple of the end times, the, the, the eschatological. Eschatological is just a word that means the last things, right? The last temple. They were meant to build together their project. Uh, you may remember when they returned from the exile, um, you know, King Cyrus of Persia. This is the beginning of the book of Ezra. King Cyrus of Persia judged them that their mission in returning to Jerusalem is to rebuild the temple. So Jesus is meant to be the stone, the cornerstone. But of course, you know, um, they're rejecting it. They're going to kill him. Okay? And, and again, you know, when Peter is speaking again to the religious leaders of Israel in Acts chapter 4, um, you know, when he's, you know, they, they were healing a man. Remember that man they healed in the temple? And, um, and, and Peter said to them, this Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. So but then you wonder, what cornerstone is it? It is the cornerstone of the temple that Jesus said, I will destroy this temple and build it up on the third day. So Jesus is saying, well, I am the chief cornerstone of that temple. So in his resurrection, in the resurrection of Jesus, he established the house of David, the house of God that David wanted to build. It's not a, it's not a physical building. It's a human building. Okay. So here is 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Peter, remember, Peter is the one that Jesus was saying to, well, you know, Peter, I'll build the, um, I'll build the house, I'll build my church upon this rock. And the Roman Catholic says um, the rock is Peter, but Peter tells us he's not the rock. See, he's saying, he's saying to believers, as you believers come to him, that is to Jesus, a living stone, rejected by people. So here is, is Peter referring back to Jesus being the the, uh, the stone rejected by the builders in his death, but chosen and honored by God. So he's now the chosen, honored, chief cornerstone of the new temple that God is building in our midst. And then he says in verse 5, 
of 1 Peter 2, you, you believers, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You see, Peter is telling us that he's not the rock. Jesus is the living stone upon which we ourselves believers as living stones are being built to be a spiritual house, being built to be a holy priesthood. You see, it's not a physical house. It's a holy priesthood. It's a house of priests, holy priesthood. You see, this is a great privilege. Every Christian is a priest. You know, there is a sense in the Tongan um, culture that we, only the five fecals, the ministers are called the, the priest, okay? The kautaula eiki. But when you come to the Bible, you no, know, everyone is kautaula eiki. Every believer is a taula eiki. All of us, we belong to the holy priesthood of God, who offers a spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, yeah, Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the spiritual house of David. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, verses um, 19, um, let me just do this down a little bit. Uh, so I hope you're able to see this. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Uh, this is Paul talking to the believers. So then you believers are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household build on the foundation of the apostles and prophets of Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Do you see? So the, found, the cornerstone of Jesus, but the foundation is laid by the apostles of the New Testament and the prophets. So now we can see the cornerstone, right, upon which the foundation is laid by the scriptures. The scriptures of the Old Testament are by the prophets. The scriptures of the New Testament are of the apostles. And so, therefore, the foundation of God's temple, the new temple in Jesus, is the scriptures, and Jesus is the chief cornerstone of that. In him, verse 21, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you that is, believers who are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. So you see, the temple that um, God promised to David is believers being built upon Christ to be the spiritual house. Okay, And it's the same, um, the same thing Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.16. 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you yourselves know that he's talking to the church that you are God's temple and the spirit of God lives in you. Now, you know, the Mormon church used this idea pointing to every Mormon, every, every person, that your body is the um, temple of the Lord. But I, I think, I do believe that, um, that what God is, is, is saying, it's only the body of believers. Your believer in Jesus, your body is the temple because you've been bought with a price. Okay, that's what um, that's what Paul says in one Corinthians, one Corinthians six. So there you are. Okay, John was expecting a day of wrath, a day of destruction. Jesus came and fulfilled the promise to David to bring a kingdom, the kingdom of God, to our midst. And in bringing the kingdom of God into our midst, He set us free from the tyranny of Satan. See, this is what we've been saying. That the um, you remember how there's the seven foundational talanois uh, upon which the each gospel is built upon talanois of the baptism John's baptism uh, the talanois of um, Jesus setting us free from the tyranny of Satan in his earthly ministry and his death his resurrection his appearances his proclamation to the nations coming again his ascension coming again but he's he, he's setting us free from the tyranny of Satan. Is the big story of his earthly ministry because it's just that he comes and confronts the world and Satan with the power of the kingdom of God. And then when he departs in his ascension, he's already laid the foundation 
to build up the house of God. So we are the house of God. People who belong to the kingdom of God, we become the house of God built upon Jesus as the chief cornerstone. And so now Jesus, through his death and his resurrection, is ascended, exalted to the heaven, is coming on the clouds. Now, I want to show you that um, when Jesus talks about him coming in the clouds um, in the in the Gospels, he's not talking about his second coming. He's talking about his ascension, his ascension to the right hand of God. Okay? And this is the, 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 uh, the, the third main event. So the first main event, Elijah will come. Second main event, the Lord comes, Lord Jesus comes, bringing a kingdom and a house. The third main event, the exaltation of Jesus is coming on the clouds to the right hand of God. Right? So in the Old Testament, the hope of the Old Testament was that he, a son of man will rule over everything. You know, this is why God created us in his image. So Psalm 8 says, what is human beings that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him. You made him a little less than God. You crowned him with glory and honor. And you made him ruler over the works of your hand. You put everything under his feet. So a son of man will rule over everything that God had created. Now, Daniel chapter 7 tells us, gives us the vision of that event, of the son of man who is now crowned to rule over everything. So here is Daniel 7, verses 13, 14. I continued watching in the night visions, and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the engine of days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So you see, this is the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven to heaven, approaching the engine of days in heaven. You see, it's not coming to earth, it's coming to heaven, to God in heaven, so that he's given the dominion, he's established as the king of the kingdom of God forever. Okay? So when did this happen? Now, this goes together with the expectation of Psalm 110. Remember, I said that um, Psalm 110 verses 1 um, is, uh, is very central to Jesus being the Messiah. Jesus being the Messiah, he is the Lord of David. Okay, And so when David says, this is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So that's the expectation. A son of man will sit at the right hand of God. He will rule over the nations. He will rule over creation. Who is that son of man? When did that happen? Now, you know, Jesus, when, when they were, um, when they were um, judging him in his, on his trial, um, by the, the religious leaders, they ask him, Mark, this is Mark chapter 14, verse 61 and 62, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus said, I am. And then he said, verse 62, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So in other words, he's saying to the people of his time, people who are judging him, you will see me coming on the clouds. So, which means that this is not something that is going to be delayed to another time. This is him coming in the clouds will happen exactly during those times. It's the same that he, same thing he says in uh, Matthew 24, verses 30, 30, 35. He says, the Son of Man will appear in the sky. All the peoples of earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, one end of the sky to the other. And then he says, truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. What did he mean that will never pass away? 
What does he mean that these things will happen in his generation? Well, he means he's coming on the clouds. He's, it will happen in his generation. The same thing he, he says in Mark 13, 26. I wanted to show you this because a lot of people are confused about this. They, they take this coming of Jesus from the clouds to be the second coming. But I want to tell you, this is not the second coming. Jesus is talking about his ascension. Let me show you. Then he, so he said, this is Mark 13. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, great power and glory. Same thing, he will send out his angels to gather the elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. And he said again, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So he's, again, he's assuring them that they will see him coming in the, in the clouds. They will see him coming in and gathering all his elects from the end to the earth. Again, if you come to Luke 21, he says the same thing. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is near. And then again, he says, truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So he's coming in the clouds meant to be seen there and then in, the, in those days. So when will that happen? Well, it happened um, when he was ascended, right? So let me read to you from Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Acts chapter 1, and here is verse 9. This is his ascension. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of sight. So you see, he was taken up to heaven, ascended, but he was taken on the clouds in fulfillment of Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, which says, Son of man comes in clouds to the ancient of days, to heaven, to God, in order to be seated at the right hand of God, to be the king to rule over all creation. So you see that Jesus is already coming on the clouds, seated at the right hand of God. And so the next event after he's seated in his exaltation at the right hand of God is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So just to recap, Elijah comes first to prepare the Lord's coming. The Lord comes to bring a kingdom and a house his exaltation is him coming on the clouds, the right hand of God, to rule over the kingdom of God. Okay, And now he sends out the Holy Spirit. The idea of sending out the Holy Spirit is to gather his elect to him. Remember, Jesus predicts the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you've heard me speak about, for John the Bap so for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So there he's talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as the fulfillment of what John was saying, that when Jesus comes, he will baptize people with the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, that happens also uh, because um, verse 8, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you may be familiar with, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, now that Jesus is ascended, seated at the right hand, coming on the cloud, seated at the right hand of God, he sends out his Holy Spirit to empower us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to gather his elect to himself, see? And that's what he's doing. So when the, when the Spirit was poured out, remember, they were confused in Jerusalem. They thought the disciples were drunk. Um, but Peter got up and he spoke to them and he told them, no, this is what Jesus, um, this is because Jesus is exalted. This, is, this shows that Jesus is now the Lord and Christ seated at the right hand of God. He has exalted, uh, gone um, on with the clouds to the presence of God, 
seated at the right hand of God to be the king over all creation. So therefore, uh, this is Acts chapter 2. This is a conclusion of his preaching. Peter is saying God has raised his Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has, has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So you see, it's now the Lord and Messiah. He's, he, he was ascended, taken up on the clouds to the right hand of God. If you see that there is the Christ and Lord to rule over this kingdom, of course, his kingdom. Is his house because we are his kingdom, his house. So we're told um, that Jesus must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished, of course, is death. God has put everything under his feet. So you see, that's the that's what uh, the expectation you know, from Psalm eight. God has put everything under the Son of Man. Now, when it says everything is put under him. It is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. When everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him so that God may be all in all. So at the end, Jesus will hand over the kingdom to the Father. The Father will be the all in all. So when will that happen? See, when will Jesus hand over the kingdom to God? And that's when... Jesus will appear again. That's the last event we're talking about. So that's the, the last event is the day of the Lord comes to bring new creation. So Elijah comes, right, um, uh, preparing the Lord's coming. Jesus, the Lord Jesus comes, bringing a kingdom and a house. And the Lord's exaltation coming on the clouds, seated the right hand of God to rule over the, over his people, sending out the Holy Spirit so that you know, the gospel is brought to the end of the earth to bring the elect into his kingdom and into his house. Then the day of the Lord comes, it brings a new creation. So those are the five events of the coming, second coming of Jesus. So Jesus will appear again. Now, there is an event that Revelation 20 uh, is talking about that a lot of people are looking forward to, but I believe it's already happened, okay? Um the Revelation 24 to 5 says, And then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus, and because of the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their heads. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. So you see, there is an event there called the first resurrection, and they're saying the first resurrection is for those who were killed because of their testimony for Jesus. But I think also Paul says that even we believers also have been raised with Jesus, right? Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. But God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So you see that not only those who were beheaded, you know, being raised to rule with Christ, but also us believers, we've been raised. So we, if you're a believer, You've been raised with Christ. We are part of the first resurrection. We are alive. Paul says that our lives are hidden with God in heaven. Now, but what would happen then before the coming of Jesus? So first resurrection's already happened. We are awaiting then Jesus coming and bringing about the general resurrection. Everyone will be raised. And those who did not believe in God will be raised to be condemned. But those of us who have been raised with Christ, 
we will be um, taken into the new creation. Now, Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 tells us there's one event that will happen to indicate that Jesus is really coming soon. And then he says, it, it is this, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in God's temple, proclaiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember that I told you this? You know what currently restrains him so that he will be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he's out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. See, this is the man of lawlessness. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. So do you see that? It's almost like there will be a great apostasy. That is, people will turn away from true faith in Christ. You know, I do believe that we are living in that kind of time. You see, the churches are turning away from true God. Homosexuality, I think, is the issue that is turning the churches away from Christ. You may have heard of the Anglican Communion. They are now the second sort of, you know, the Methodist Church struggling with the issue. The majority of people are now moving towards accepting homosexuality. Minorities got it now. The Anglican Church now following. It's a great apostasy. People are turning away from true and sound biblical doctrine. But then, you know, you've got to wait until you see the man of lawlessness. And I do believe it's going to be a person. I don't know who he, wa who he will be. I don't think it will be the Pope. A lot of people are interpreting it to be the Pope. No, this, this person will come and, and, and identify himself as God. But you see, Paul is saying, at the point when he appears, Jesus will appear at the same time and destroy him. So it's almost like he appears, Jesus appears, destroy him and bring everything into fruition. And we ourselves will be raptured, of course, right? The dead in Christ will rise. If you're still alive at the time, we will be changed. And then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So expectation is we ourselves will be saved, will be raptured. Why the delay? Of the coming of Jesus. Well, 2 Peter 3, verses 9 to 10 says, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you await for the day of God and hasten its coming. Because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat. But based on his promise, we wait for new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. So you see, the day of the Lord will come. We will be raptured. Everything will be destroyed. We look forward to the home of righteousness, the new creation. It will come like a thief, says Paul, right? We don't know the time. About the times and the seasons, 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written to you. We don't need to know times or dates, okay? For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come I'm just like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So it means a lot of people will not be prepared. A lot of people will not be expecting the coming of the Lord. But of course, he will come. He will bring just judgment 
upon the enemy, since it is just for God to repay. This is 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 10. Since it is just for God to repay with affliction, those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us, this will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels, when he takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't even obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength on that day when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be marveled at by all those who have believed because our testimony among you was believed. So you see, it will be a day it will be bad for those who disobey the gospel. So how must we prepare for it? Just to finish off, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 to 10. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. You must remember this. When life gets tough and, and you get a lot of bad experience, suffering, maybe diseases or suffering in your marriage or suffering in your workplace or all kinds of difficulties God will bring in your way in order to remind you not to trust in yourself, but to trust in him. You must always remember, it's not rough. It's no longer rough. When I was taken to the hospital for two weeks, two weeks ago, I was just sitting there thinking to myself, no, this is not rough. This is not rough. We have been appointed to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's working his purpose in me. So that to make sure that any arrogance, any boastfulness that remains in me, any residue of sin is, do, is done away with. See, this is why he brings suffering to us believers to purify our faith like gold. Because Jesus died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, my friends, Encourage one another and build each other up as you already doing. Father, we thank you. This is a very um, clear narrative of what to expect for your coming. Great apostasy, we see people turning away from you. Lord, I pray that you continue to establish us in sound doctrines, in the sound faith, biblical faith. Protect us from falling away. Protect us from being overtaken by this apostasy. And if this man of lawlessness appears, comfort us knowing that you will appear. We won't have to suffer through it. But we know that the spirit of lawlessness is already working now with people turning away from all kinds of the law that you have put in us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you please help us to see the signs of the time and to be ready for your coming, to make sure that we live in intimate fellowship with you, whether we are awake or asleep, that we are always, always with you, and that we always listen to your voice, because we are your sheep. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, um, were there any, any questions there? Oh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, I mean, the, the response for us is, yep, yep, my grandma. Oh, yeah, um, I found the whole thing interesting. I just wanted to get a extra, um, just a extra explanation on us being the temple of God. Uh, um, yeah, I just wanted to know, like, because uh, Christ is the temple, and, right, and... Because of him, we become the temple of God. Because it was a misconception as before coming as a reformed Christian. Um, I always thought I was the temple of God, but then coming to like reading the Bible and learning more that Jesus is that temple, right? And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I just want confirmation on like how, how am I the temple of Christ of God and with knowing that Christ is that temple. Yeah, see, I think that what I was showing you there, that when Jesus said, I'm the temple, I will destroy his temple and set it up in, the in three days' time, uh, 
all the New Testament points to Jesus as becoming in his resurrection the chief cornerstone of that temple. Okay? So in other words, he is the temple because he is the chief cornerstone of that temple. And then Peter tells us, you believers, we believers, are being brought in and are built up upon that foundation. Mm -hmm. So you just imagine a house. You have the foundation, then you build the house. So the foundation, the chief cornerstone is Jesus in his resurrection. He is the rock rejected, the stone rejected, has become the chief cornerstone. Okay? So as the chief cornerstone, then he is the, you know, we're told, of course, by Paul, that um, not only him, but also the prophets and the apostles are built into him as the foundation of the house. So in other words, the, the foundation of the house is the scriptures. And as believers, when you believe in God, then you are being built up upon this. So that's why you, we become the temple. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, you are the temple. You are the temple of God. That is, he's talking about believers corporately. Mm -hmm. But then you get to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 to 20. He says, your body is the temple. So flee sexual immorality, right? So that's individually as believers because, and then he gives us the reason, because we have been bought with a price by Christ. So your redemption and my redemption in Christ means that God has brought us in, brought us in, and built us up to be his holy temple. So therefore, his spirit lives in us, okay? Then when you think about it, you know, um, I, I think it, it speaks about the, the way we should relate to each other. Our lives should be built upon um, the foundation of the scriptures. But also we should regard each other as parts of this temple. Imagine if, um, if a house, if your house, suddenly, you know, a set of bricks is removed mm. from it. Yeah. It will become unstable, wouldn't it? Yeah, true. So, in other words... Yeah, we've got to thank God, you know, and I, I'm always thankful when I when I think about what God is doing in building us up as his house, spiritual house. I always remember that Jesus was a carpenter when he's here on earth. And I'm in good hands. See, I always tell myself, look, I shouldn't be worried about anything about this house because Jesus the carpenter is continuing on to build his house room. So that's that's the sense in which Jesus becomes as the temple, becomes the chief cornerstone upon which us believers are being built up. And so corporately, we are the house of God. So this is why, you know, I always say to people, look, God doesn't live in the church house. You know how in Tonga you get into the church house and they say, oh, you know, you shouldn't swear in here because, you know, God is living here. You shouldn't do any bad things here because he's the house of God. But that's hypocrisy, isn't it? We should remember that God doesn't live in a house. He lives in us. So the house, the Amen. church house, the church house becomes the house of God exactly. because we are in it. Okay? Once we leave it, it's just a, it's just a rain shelter. Okay? We make a big fuss about the, the church building, but, but see, only the idols live in a house. In the Mormon temple, and the Buddhist temple, they build, they build their temple for their God because their God is not a, a living God. Their God is a dead God. The Buddhist is the same thing. We Christians don't build temple. Our church building is not a temple, even though a lot of church ministers would like to call it a temple. Not a temple. It's just a rain shelter, just to shelter us. You know, you just build a shed, get in there, do your church worship in there because the house of God it's the people who gathered there with the God. We are the temple of God, the house of God. So I always say that the holy place of God is where believers are gathering. Yes. That's the holy place of God. It's not the house, you know. And, and I mean, right. you, you probably know this, uh, Makarema, because, you know, you're a, you're a, uh, you're a descendant of a, of a, of a, of a great Tongan minister. You know, the, the people in Tonga, they call the church building a potu tapu, potu tapu tapu, right? Most holy place, yeah. especially, the, especially the front part. You know how they call the front part? 
And I've been arguing against this ever since I was at I was at Chetul. They didn't believe me. <laughs> they kicked me out. But anyway, I've been saying to them, look, it's not the most holy place. The most holy place is where the people are sitting in, in, the, <laughs> in the house. That's where God dwells, in the midst of his people, not in the front part of the building. <laughs> anyway, it comes from that. We are the temple because we are built upon Jesus, the chief cornerstone. By his resurrection, he's become the precious stone upon which we are being built. To be his spiritual house, is it? Is that clear? Oh, that that is way more than I expected. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Some practical, some, some practical application as well, because this is a this is an issue that hardly anybody remembers. You know how they, uh, you know, the one way of saying it, this is when you get to the, you know, how they do the fakata. They say, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, go and be potu go fakata Ma on on. I, I think that's just hypocrisy. Mm. See, if we say that the church building is the only place where we can be righteous, mm. it means you can be unrighteous once you get out, isn't it? <laughs> so, it's, so, like when I do for a tapu, I shouldn't tapu get 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 top tapu if I get all. No. Yeah, I mean that's that's, that's wrong, right? Yeah. It's wrong because I mean, there's no holy soil, holy place. Yeah. I just I usually say tapu kihe potu tapu afio ai potu ah no kai. Ah, okay. Yeah. So you're yeah. connecting the dwelling place of God with the people, and you're acknowledging that that's the potu tapu tapu. That's the most holy place. The most holy place is where God dwells. Where does He dwell? With where His people dwells, because they are His temple. Wow. Yeah, sorry. Well, it reminds me yeah. about the um, that scripture. Our one of our prayer points, mm. one Corinthians yeah. six. Yes. Um, yes. Verses nineteen to twenty about don't yep. you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in mm. you, yep. whom you have from God. You are not of your own. Yep. You are bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Yep. So yeah, I just was. I just thought about that as. Yeah. Um. Yeah, yes. the question was asked, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. No, that's good. It's good to be reminded about these things because you see, this, these are our new identities in Christ. We see that the, the, the world is looking for an identity, you know, for a new self, but our self is found in Christ. He's built us up to be his house, his dwelling place. And so that's why we're not, we, don't, we don't belong to ourselves anymore. We belong to him. And so we should be thinking every day about how we should be glorifying him and show in our lives that we don't we no longer belong to this world. We're not out to pursue um richness and our treasure is not in this world. We we belong to another world. We live under the the uh, the kingship of Jesus, who's now ruling from the right hand of God. And we are his household. We are his church. And he promises to build us up. And so Paul says that uh, him and Apollos are just servants. So that's, that's the distinctiveness of the minister. We, 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 have no diff- we have no distinction from the rest of the, the believers, just the ability to teach the word. That's what should distinguish a minister from the rest of the congregation. We should not have a special seat in front. Um, we should sit together with the people because we are the first and foremost of sinners. We all come to God in need of his forgiveness. But also, you know, we are all members of his household, his church. There is no distinctions among us. We're all priesthood, priesthood of all believers, and, and we are your servants to just to water and, and um, you know, to plant, God gives the growth. So my my main task as a pastor and every pastor should be concerned about is to pray for the growth of the church because God gives the growth, okay? Now, before we finish tonight, if there's any, if there's no other question, um, 
If you, I mean, it depends on you. I, I'm, I'm quite willing to do a to go through the review questions next week with you because, I mean, we this is our this should be our last class. But if you want to go through the review questions just to remind ourselves and to make sure you get the right answers for the exam, I'm happy to run this class again next week. But you know, well, let's do it like this: uh, only if you want to to come, okay? <laughs> because our term is finished. Finished today. That's the end of our next next term. I, I believe we will study the prophets. Um, but if you want to come to a, a, a review of those exam questions, um, turn in next week, same time, eh? and uh, we'll go for it. Then I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, there's also a secret question. Well, not a secret question, but an extra question that will make you think mm -hmm. and apply what you have learned from the rest of the term into. Um, into uh, interpreting the Gospels in the light of the cross of Christ. Eh? But overall, any any other any other matter, any other concerns or question? So, I mean, there's a question in the review um, questions I sent you today about today's question. I hope you'd go back and you'd be able to do it. So the five events, Elijah comes, Jesus comes with the kingdom in the house, <laughs> he's exalted coming in the clouds, okay? And now he's building his house and um, and the Lord will come again, okay? But I think you've got to realize that, um, yes, he's coming again. We, we, we are in that time of apostasy awaiting the, the appearance of the man of lawlessness. Um, and, and once the man of lawlessness appears, immediately Jesus will appear to destroy him, and then to bring everything, uh, the new a new creation hope uh, will, will be brought into uh, realization. And, you know, um, I am comforted knowing that our God is faithful. He started this good work in us, and I pray that he will take it into completion in the day of the Lord Jesus. I always pray for my 11th hour. <laughs> the hour before I passed away. I pray that the Lord will keep me safe in his hands, that I may not turn out and uh, reject my Lord, because anything could happen, um, even in my last hour of existence. Do you know, I trust that God's goodness is new every morning. And uh, when, that, when that hour comes, there will be new mercies to keep you and me faithful until we see Jesus, right? Until then, God bless you. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you again next week. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to join the, uh, the, that 